I went back into the library stacks to find new material, but instead I found old material, very old. The ancient fathers of the early church. I found a, a, a series of volumes entitled The Sunday Sermons of the Early Church Fathers. And as soon as I began reading, I knew I'd struck gold. These early church fathers made the Bible come alive in a way that I'd never heard before. And at first I wasn't sure what's so different about their sermons than my favorite preacher and the homilies that he would deliver. And then I realized, as St. Augustine put it, they would always show how the New Testament is concealed in the Old and the Old is revealed and fulfilled in the New. It was like divine poetry. When you read how the New is concealed in the Old and the Old is revealed and fulfilled in the New, you realize there is an artistry, there's a beauty, a subtlety, a kind of poetry when it comes to how much God loves us. And so as you continue reading the early church fathers, as I was doing, their ordinary Sunday sermons were filled with all of these nuggets. Sunday after Sunday, I kept sharing all of these things. And like me, they knew both sets of stories. They just never saw the connections. And the more I was helping them make connections between the old and the new, the more both the old and the new were coming alive. I was doing more and more research. Reading now the early church fathers, but reading now for the first time, Catholic writers, names that I should have known, but I never read. Finally, I came out one night to kind of share my findings with my devout evangelical Protestant wife who loved my preaching, who knew I was stealing from the fathers, but that's where it stopped. And so I was working through the Constitution on the Church Lumen Gentium and I came out, I'm like, you gotta hear this. And I began reading it. And I said, this is the teaching of the Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council. I said, I'm wondering if God isn't asking me to be open to the possibility of becoming a Catholic. And her eyes got wide as saucers. And she said, couldn't we be Episcopalians? <laughs> and I knew we were going into you know, uncharted waters, shall we say. To make a long story short, you know, I ended up applying to various places for a PhD and I got accepted on a full ride at Notre Dame and Marquette. I decided to go study under the Jesuits in Milwaukee at Marquette because they had a group of about a half a dozen Jesuit scholars who were experts on the Bible as well as the early church fathers. And so we packed up a U-Haul and we moved in the mid eighties, but not before Kimberly had sort of extracted a, a, a promise from me not to do anything rash or sudden. You know, if you ever become a Catholic, I want to know long in advance. And so I said, well, five years at minimum. I mean, just so it would look intellectually respectable to all of my colleagues, you know. I'm not much, but I, I'm all I think about. So five years was enough for her. She was okay with that. But our first semester, or I should say mine, we began reading the early church fathers along with, you know, the uh, St. Hippolytus who began unpacking the liturgy. And even more, St. Justin Martyr, who described what worship was like in the early church back in the middle of the second century. And by then it had already become a permanent fixture. And so I found myself coming away from my doctoral seminars, wondering what if any residue might remain of the ancient liturgy of the early church that the fathers described in the Catholic mass. I'd never gone to a mass. I'd never wanted to go. I had been told not to go from high school years on because they're re-crucifying Jesus, which of course we're not doing, you know, but it was a, a blasphemous sacrilege according to Martin Luther and John Calvin. But when I got a campus bulletin in my mailbox, I remember reading that there would be a weekday mass in a basement chapel at noon. So I thought to myself, I could skip lunch and go down to the basement like a, an observer with my Bible and a notebook, and that's what I did. That day I went down right around noon, walking down the steps. I remember passing the holy water font and I wasn't about to dip my fingers. It was, I don't know why, but Catholic cooties, I, I just was there <laughs> as a journalist, an observer. So I sat in the very back pew, you know, expecting maybe a few old nuns, but instead businessmen were coming in for their lunch break, housewives with their kids. There were some bag ladies from the side streets of Milwaukee dipping their fingers, genuflecting, kneeling, praying, preparing for the holy sacrifice of the mass. I saw no one who would recognize me, so I stayed. And when the bell rang and this priest stepped out of the sacristy, everybody stood up except 
for that lone Protestant in the back pew, I'm just jotting my observations. And as I listen to the opening rite, it's exactly what St. Justin Martyr described. That as I listen to the penitential rite and how all the people were asking God for mercy and the priest was promising, assuring them of divine pardon, it's like a checklist. And then as they all sat down, the lector got up and began reading from the Bible and I was struck by the fact that the first reading was taken from the Old Testament. In my Bible church, we hadn't had a reading from the Old Testament in at least a year and a half. And then it was followed by a responsorial psalm. And by the time we got to the gospel, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but all of the people stood up except for me. I wasn't sure why they were. And then I realized they were standing out of reverence for the gospel. And I'm thinking, why don't we do that? I mean, we're the Bible Christians. But when I heard the reading from the gospel, it struck me as obvious that somebody had strategically planned the readings because the promises in the old were what Christ was talking about fulfilling in the new. And as they all sat down, I'm thinking to myself, this is where the early church fathers got it, from the lectionary. The old and the new were being read together in the first few centuries. And then I sat back to hear a homily, and in less than two minutes, the homilist was done. And I'll be perfectly honest and a little blunt, I was underwhelmed. I'm like, are you serious? Is that the most you can do with those readings? I was tempted to, you know, offer a little tag team ecumenical preaching. I'll take it from here and show you what the early church fathers would have done, but thankfully ever, for everybody else, I didn't give into that temptation. I just sat back and watched as all the action shifted away from the ambo or the pulpit, as we called it, over to the altar where the priest now stood. And as I sat forward and I watched, I listened closely because the preface to the Eucharistic prayer followed by the anaphora once again was a perfect match. I had seen the checklist of about a dozen correspondences between the early church liturgy, the ancient patristics describe, and the Catholic mass. As I'm listening to his prayer, I am hearing not only familiar phrases from their writings, but parts from scripture, especially from the Passover. And I'm struck by all of this. And then I heard for the first time, a Catholic priest pronounce the solemn words of consecration. And as soon as those words left his lips, this is my body, and he elevated the host, I knew it wasn't bread any longer. I knew that I knew it was really his body. By the time he consecrated the chalice, and I heard those words, and he elevated that chalice, I could literally feel myself drooling with this holy thirst for his precious blood. And I'm wondering, what's happening to me? What's going on here? And then suddenly, a, a few moments later, all of the people around me began to chant as if on cue, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Then they said, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the same thing a second time. Then Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us peace, they dropped to their knees. The priest elevated the host and said a fourth time, behold the Lamb of God. And he went on to bless those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And suddenly I knew right where I was, I wasn't, simply in a basement chapel for a weekday mass at noon, I was in the back of the Bible in the book of Revelation, where in chapter 19, 9, we hear about the marriage supper of the Lamb. But I also recognized that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called many things, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Alpha and Omega. But the one thing that he's called in that book, more than all of the other titles put together practically, is Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. 28 texts in 22 chapters, and nobody had ever even tried to explain to me, why is that the primary title? So while everybody else is going forward for Holy Communion, I'm going backwards in my Bible, looking down and seeing, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, there, oh wait, what is that? Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts. They must have memorized Revelation 4, verse eight as well, because I had just heard that a few minutes earlier. And as I'm seeing the, the Trishagion, the Holy, 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 the Agnos Dei, the Lamb of God, I'm realizing that's what the early church fathers also described. And as I'm turning the pages, I'm looking forward as the people have received and they're coming back, they're kneeling down, they're giving thanks, and I'm seeing their candles, liturgical vestments, presbyters up there. Oh yeah, there are chalices on top of the altar, just like there. And then the climax, 
is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I never really put that together, but it occurred to me, if there's a marriage supper, who is the bridegroom? Well, Jesus, of course, but who is the bride of our Lord? Well, the church is. I always thought the marriage supper of the Lamb was at the end of time. Here it was at noon in a basement chapel where Christ was saying to the church through his priest what I could have said to Kimberly on our wedding night. This is my body which is given up for you. Only Jesus was communicating that not just to my head, but to my heart. It's all quiet. Everybody's kneeling. I'm looking down on the pages of the apocalypse, looking up and seeing what has just unfolded before my eyes, trying to figure out where am I? In a basement chapel or in the heavenly Jerusalem? For a Catholic mass or for the liturgy of the angels and saints? Because they were the same songs. The holy, 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 the Lamb of God, the Alleluia, the Gloria, the same furniture, the same vestments, the same sacrifice of the Lamb. It was quiet until the priest stood and everybody else and when he was done pronouncing the benediction, he stepped out, the people knelt, they left, and at about 10 minutes later, I was alone in the back pew of the basement chapel, again, trying to figure out, did I go downstairs or did I get whisked up to heaven? And I'm just sitting there for about an hour, basking in the afterglow of these graces that had come so unexpectedly, asking our Lord, what do I do with this? And I'm thinking I could talk to John and tell him I've been to mass and ask him, he's a Catholic, he'll think I'm ready to convert. I've got four and a half years, I can't. Okay, I'll talk to Terry, he's a Protestant. He'll think I'm losing my faith. So instead I went to the library and I spent the rest of the afternoon there. By the time I left, I'd signed out a half a dozen books of the early church fathers and I got home and I thought I'd tell Kimberly where I've been and what I've done. No, I'll wait till the kids go down because at that point we had two sons and she'd be upset in front of them. And so I waited until we got the boys down and she was on the phone. And so instead I went upstairs, I opened up the Bible, I opened up the Greek New Testament, I turned to the back to the book of Revelation, I had the Greek, I had two or three English translations, and around 9 p.m. I began to read systematically through the Apocalypse of St. John. It took me about three hours to move quickly through it, but it felt like the first time I'd ever read it. I had translated the entire book, but I never really understood it until around midnight, I'm closing the book, looking at my notes, realizing that from the first two or three verses, I found things that I should have known but never saw. In Revelation 1, verse 3, Jesus pronounces the first of seven liturgical benedictions. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it read. I had always assumed he's blessing the literate and the illiterate until I noticed in the Greek Blessed is he who reads is singular. Blessed are those who read is plural. He's blessing the lector and the assembly because the liturgy is the context in which this book was meant to be read like earlier that day. And then as I continue reading, he's made us a kingdom priest to his God. No wonder we're sacrificing. And then John describes how he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Of course, the Lord's day is to the new covenant what the Sabbath was to the old. So as circumcision gave way to baptism, as the Passover gave way to the Eucharist, so the Sabbath gave way to the Lord's Day, Sunday, the day of resurrection, the day of worship. And I never really understood why it was the Lord's Day when Jesus comes and gives to John all these visions. But when John turns to see who it is that's speaking to him, he sees Jesus, but he sees him standing amidst seven golden lampstands. And then it occurred to me, that's the menorah that stood by the altar where the high priest could, would conduct the liturgy in the Jerusalem temple, only it's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the heavenly high priest wearing this long robe with a golden girdle around his breast, just like the high priest would wear. And as I continued reading, I could see in the next two or three chapters, Jesus addressing the seven churches in Asia Minor, and again and again, he said, Repent, repent, repent. Eight times to the seven churches in Asia Minor, just like we had had the penitential right at the beginning of the liturgy earlier that day. And then at the conclusion of this penitential ritual, Jesus addresses the church in a way that is familiar. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him 
As a matter of fact, that was the first verse of the Bible I'd ever committed to memory shortly after my conversion, after watching Billy Graham on TV conduct this crusade in a stadium where he quoted Revelation 3.20, inviting all of the people in the stadium to come down to the infield as the choir sang, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. But there was no altar, there was only a stage. There was no lamb, there were only a crowd of people at the foot of the stage. And there wasn't really the whole verse read. I hadn't memorized the entire verse because Revelation 3.20 goes on to say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and have supper with him and he with me. That last part was always left out. I thought Jesus was simply issuing an invitation for us to open the door of our hearts to invite him in as personal Savior and Lord, which is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, but it's not the thing that Jesus spoke of. He's saying, if you open the door that I'm knocking on, I will come in and have supper with you and you with me. I began wondering, what supper is he talking about? And then I remembered, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is the climax of the visions. And so I kept reading. And over the course of the next two and a half hours, I began to see the familiar songs but also the prayers and also the furniture with the candles and the altar. But all of the action in the first half of the apocalypse revolves around this scroll. In the Greek, the word is biblion, where we get the word Bible. The seven seals are broken, and as the scroll is unsealed, we discover at the climax of the first half of the book of Revelation in the visions of John, how Jesus fulfills the old covenant and the gospel is proclaimed. And so the first half of the liturgy of heaven consists in the liturgy of the word like it was in the first half of the mass earlier that day when the, the book is opened, the contents are proclaimed as having been fulfilled by the lamb. By the time you get to the midpoint of the apocalypse as I did around 10, 15 that night, I'm realizing, okay, the scroll is open and proclaimed as having been fulfilled by the lamb. And then all the action shifts away from the book to this altar in heaven where Jesus is now standing in his liturgical vestment, just like the priest was in the basement chapel in the second part of the liturgy. And I remembered that in the ancient church, you have the synaxis and the Eucharist, the liturgy of the word followed by the liturgy of the sacrament. Word and sacrament, a perfect match for the worship of the angels and the saints in heaven. And then suddenly I'm noticing as I'm finishing up the second half, that up on the altar, there are these seven chalices that contain wine, but when they're poured out, they've become blood. And at the climax of the seven chalices, you have the angel issuing the invitation to the faithful to come to share in the marriage supper of the lamb. Now, let me just put it to you. Does any of this sound vaguely familiar? Have you been someplace recently where the first half revolves around a book that is opened and read and proclaimed as having been fulfilled by the Lamb? And then the second half, you're looking at a man behind an altar and you can see the chalices no matter where you are. And they contain wine, but when they're poured out, they become blood because the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and Christ the bridegroom is inviting us as his bride to come and share his body and his blood. By the time I was closing my books around midnight, I'm thinking, this is a perfect match for the Mass. I had been reading this book, but never experiencing the liturgy of the Eucharist, but one time was all it took to kind of open my eyes to see that you won't find rapture, antichrist, second coming, anywhere on the page of the apocalypse, but the only thing I found on every page of the apocalypse that night was the liturgy, the worship, the sacrifice, of the heavenly high priest, who is the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, and the angels and the saints singing their thanksgiving, their praise, the gloria, the alleluia, the holy, holy, holy. No, I'm making this stuff up. It's too late. You know, I, I've got an overactive imagination. So around midnight, I turned to the stack of books that I'd signed out earlier that day. And so I just looked at the fathers. I checked in the back of each book for the indices. Where do they refer to the apocalypse? Where do they refer to the marriage supper of the Lamb? How do they understand it? Is it just futuristic for them or is it also Eucharistic? And sure enough, over and over again, the early church fathers were interpreting the book of Revelation in liturgical terms as not only futuristic, but also Eucharistic. And so the next day, 
I should mention that around 3 a.m. I closed all my books. And it were night owls, Kimberly and I, but I wasn't sure if she'd still be awake. But if she is, I will admit to her where I, where I went, what I did, and what I found. At 3 a.m., she was fast asleep. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> because the next day, I skipped lunch again. I walked down the stairs, and I attended Mass at noon. And the next day, and the next day. For the next two weeks, I skipped lunch, and I fell in love with our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Finally, after a couple of weeks, I came clean. And she was startled and not happy. You've done what? Where? When? Why? Wait a minute. She's like, four and a half more years. Oh, I know. I'm just, I'm just going to study. Yeah, she could see right through me. I couldn't see it yet myself. And so I called a local pastor, Monsignor Brusco. It's now the retired bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska, but he became my spiritual father there in Milwaukee. And I set up an appointment. We got together one Saturday morning, and I just blurted out, how do you understand the book of Revelation? He kind of chuckled. He said, well, probably different than what you're used to from Protestants, evangelicals, and fundamentalists, because we don't just see it as applying to the end of time. We also see it applying to the Mass. Where do you find that? He said, well, as a matter of fact, you, you, you find it in the prayers of the Eucharist. You also find it in early church fathers. You find it in the book of Revelation itself. But it's funny because right before you walked in, I was reading my devotional, and in this book, Seasons of Grace, Father Pius Parsh was reflecting upon Revelation 4 and 5, the holy, 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 and the Lamb of God, pointing out that when we gather for Mass and we sing these songs, we're singing what the saints and angels are all singing. We're sharing in their worship. I'm like, give me that book. You know, how highly unoriginal of me. I realized in that hour, I had sort of reinvented the wheel of the ancient church's liturgy and the connections with the apocalypse. About two hours went by. I said goodbye. We set up another appointment. Week after week after week, for a few months, we are sitting, we are talking, the time is flying, he's making more and more connections. Little did I know he was not just your average pastor, he had a doctorate in theology, he loved the fathers, and he was helping me make more connections than I ever even knew existed. And finally, you know, I, I said to him after several months of meetings, hypothetically speaking, Monsignor, if a Protestant pastor wanted to become a Catholic, would he have to go through like RCIA for a year? <laughs> hypothetically speaking, of course. He said, well, of course, yeah, hypothetically speaking, Scott, you're ready to teach the RCIA. I could receive you into the church this Easter. I said, when is that? He said, that's less than a month. I said, let me get back to you on that. So, you know, I, I, I walked back home and I, I, I saw Kimberly in the kitchen. And I'm like, would you pray about releasing me from this promise to wait, you know, five years or four and a half more? She chuckled. She went, I pray. Why would I pray about that? And I said, well, because... Delaying obedience to what I know is true is feeling more like disobedience every day. And she said, that's clever. And I thought so myself. I had rehearsed that line several times, you know. And she didn't say a word. She just went back to cooking. And after dinner, we got the kids down and she found me in my study and she said, I've been praying about it. And I know our Lord wants me to release you from this promise, but what are we talking about here? And I said, well, Monsignor said this Easter. This Easter? That's less than four weeks. And I said, I know, but he could receive me into the church. And he will, now that you've released me. <laughs> and she said, if you're going to become a Catholic this Easter, I want to be there to see what they're going to do to you. You know, to this day, she doesn't quite remember what she was afraid of. You know, electrode implanted in my forehead or 666 tattooed on my wrist, you know. But I said, if you're going to come to the Mass for the first time, I want to prepare you because there is more of the Bible read in a Mass than you will ever hear in a Protestant service. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, right. I mean, the Catholic kids I knew growing up didn't know the Bible at all. You know, I can't imagine that's true. And I'm like, it's true. And so for the next two or three weeks, I tried to explain to her, argue her into submission. Into, well, it didn't work very well at all. And so I just kind of backed off. We went on a date right before Easter Vigil. But as we got to the parish for the Easter vigil, I thought I had prepared her pretty well. I thought I was ready until we're sitting up front in the dark and we're given candles. And she asks, what are these for? I said, you'll see. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so we suddenly heard Monsignor intone the exaltet. And when he got to the O Felix Culpa, O Happy Fault, 
we were following along and it was startling. It was so illuminating. Even Kimberly was excited. And as the Easter candle procession was finishing up and as the mass began to unfold in the liturgy of the word, sure enough, the first reading was taken from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, followed by a, re a responsorial psalm. See, I told you. And then there was a second reading from the Old Testament and another psalm and a third reading from Genesis and another psalm and then a fourth reading from Exodus about the Passover and another psalm and then a fifth, a sixth and a seventh Old Testament reading from Isaiah and Ezekiel and every time a psalm and she's like, you're not kidding. I, I told you, <laughs> I had no idea. It was like riches in abundance. By the time we stood up, to hear the gospel, we were holding hands, she was clutching tight, and she was just excited. She said, this is glorious, I, I, I'm trying to tell you. And then after the gospel, we sat down and the homily wasn't over in two minutes. It wasn't even over in 20 minutes. But after about 25 minutes, it felt like two because he had made the scripture readings come alive. He quoted from the early church fathers, he tied it all into the Eucharist, and even Kimberly was dazzled by the homily. And then all the action shifted from the ambo, the pulpit, over to the altar where we began to hear the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, and all of the rest. And then when we knelt, I watched as my wife sat. She wouldn't kneel just like I wouldn't kneel in my first few masses. She folded her arms, and when I heard the words of consecration, I knew who it was, but she didn't. And when I went forward to receive, not only Holy Communion for the first time, but earlier in that liturgy, I had received conditional baptism along with confirmation, and I'd been for confession earlier that day. I came back kind of floating on cloud nine. I knelt down so filled with thanksgiving. I began to thank God for this amazing gift of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, when suddenly I'm hearing Kimberly crying. She was trying her best to hide her sobbing, but I could hear it, and all I could say was like, why would you show me your bride, Lord, and have it drive a wedge between me and mine? I didn't hear a voice, but I had a sense that I needed all of the grace I could get in order to love her. So we went to a reception. It was too awkward. We left. We went home in silence, and it was tense for the next few days. It was stressful for the next few weeks. I suggested, could I have a Bible study meet in our home? She said, are Catholics allowed to do that? Well, of course. So I deliberately timed a Bible study in our home that would coincide when she was next door in the kitchen preparing dinner. You'll never guess what book we went through, the book of Revelation. Week after week, all of these Catholics who were cradle Catholics were coming for their first Bible study, hearing about the book of Revelation. And then at dinner, can you hear, can you hear me out there? Oh, you know what, you know well I can. Well, what do you think so far? After a couple of weeks, she goes, these Catholics sure don't know the Bible. You could hear the, the spines cracking as they're beginning. You know, I admit they don't know the Bible, you know. Then after about four or five weeks, we were getting more excited. They were staying. They were joining me for daily mass at noon in the basement chapel as well. And one, day, one night I asked Kimberly over dinner, what do you think now? You see their excitement, their love in the Bible. She goes, I, I agree, but it's not fair. I'm like, what's not fair? It just doesn't seem fair to me that we spend years studying the menu while they grow up enjoying the meal. I'm like, wow. We study the menu, they enjoy the meal. But I mean, Kimberly, when you combine the two, when you look at the menu and you study the recipe and you learn the ingredients, you realize what's really happening. She's like, back off. And I tried to back off, to figure out that I'm not the Holy Spirit. And then I think it's funny because four years later when I was supposed to join the church, she startled me one day, it was Ash Wednesday, when she said in prayer, she had asked our Lord what to give up for Lent chocolate, desserts, and our Lord had said to her, I want you to give up your fight and recognize that it's not your husband, it's me, your Lord, calling you home. When she told me this on the phone, I mean, I couldn't speak for at least two minutes. My eyes were welling up with tears. We proceeded to prepare for the most glorious homecoming, a family reunion, where I got to see her go forward for her first communion. She came back aglow with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ inside of her. When we got back after a long reception, she wasted no time. It's been years since we got to teach a Bible study together, but now that we're back together, can we teach a Bible study? We were in a new location, a new residence. I said, sure, what would you like to lead us in? What would you like us to study? She goes, take a guess. And it was the book of Revelation. <laughs> 
And we were in a new town with a new group of cradle Catholics who came week after week. I'll never forget what she said. I remember her sharing at the end of one of our evening studies, how many of you want to, how many of you want to go to heaven? And of course, every hand went up. And she said, how many of you want to die? And not a single one. She said, of course, we all want to go to heaven. We just don't want to die. But we're Catholics. We don't have to die to go to heaven. All we've got to do is go to mass and heaven is where we are. The angels and saints are who we're with. Their songs, their prayers, the sacrifice, it's one and the same. And I concluded by saying, this is why in the mass, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, like never before. Now, I put all of this together eventually into a book called The Lamb's Supper, The Mass is Heaven on Earth. I hope you get a chance to read that because it's proven to be helpful to a lot of people. But much more than the book, the actual mystery itself, the mystery of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, this is what it's all about. And when you go to the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, you're going to see the correspondences. You're going to see the match. And you're going to discover why it is that the early church fathers all taught that when you hear, lift up your hearts. As St. Cyril of Alexandria said, cast off worldly concerns. Recognize that in the Spirit, on the Lord's Day, angels and saints now surround us, whether we see it or not. For years, I didn't see it. I didn't believe it. But it didn't make it any less real. When I finally came to discover it and to believe in it, it didn't make it any more real. It just made it much more meaningful and much more powerful in our lives. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But the fact is, we discover that we participate in his reign more through our prayers, through the liturgy of the Eucharist, than we do in our ordinary activities. And the extraordinary grace of the Eucharist is what endows our ordinary activities with this supernatural capacity. This is why I'm convinced that when we lift up our hearts, we ought to also recognize with our minds why it's stupid to be anxious. Whether the Democrats get the White House or the Republicans, whether ISIS wins or loses, no matter what, Jesus Christ is still the Lord of Lords and he's the King of Kings. And he is the one who is present in the tabernacle, upon our altars and even on our tongues endowing us and the whole church with the grace we need. The book of Revelation shows that what gets the church through all of the centuries of persecution is precisely the mass that we celebrate with him on earth as it is in heaven. And this is why I am convinced that even cradle Catholics can convert to the mystery of faith. I remember soon after sharing this with Kimberly, I gave a talk in a parish not far from here in Cleveland and I recognized in the crowd in the front row a familiar face, a classmate, Marcus Grodi. I'd gone to seminary with him, and he was sitting there shaking his head the whole time. And as I'm sharing about the Eucharist, the old and the new, he's leaning forward, he's listening. Then he's putting his head in his hands. After both talks, he came up and said, you really believe this? And he said, it makes sense. And I shared with him, who as at that time was a Presbyterian minister still, all of these books, all of this stuff, he took it home. For the next six months, he read it. He called me. We would talk. He sacrificed his whole career like I had done. He commits professional suicide. One year later, he's received in the church along with his wife, Marilyn. And he tells me what I knew all along, that what we gave up in our profession and our career isn't even worth comparing to the reality of the Mass, to Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is who we are as Catholics. This is what we do in every Mass. And this is why it's time for us to really wake up spiritually and lift up our hearts to recognize what is going on in our midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the treasure of your grace. We ask you to forgive us for taking so much grace for granted and to help us to make up for lost time in all of the years that remain. Help us and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Holy Mary, our hope, seat of wisdom, 
Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.